Hey, Mauricio here. So you've closed on your real estate transaction. Now what? Well, in today's video, we're going to talk about the 10 biggest mistakes most real estate investors make after they close their property. Number one, keeping the property in their personal name. This is probably the biggest asset protection mistake most real estate investors make because you have unlimited exposure. Doesn't matter how much the property is worth. If something happens to that property, you as the property owner is, are going to get sued and your exposure is unlimited. I don't care if the property only has $10,000 in, in equity or it's underwater in equity or whatever, the owner of the property is 100% liable with unlimited exposure. So if somebody dies, then you are gonna be 100% responsible and if the judgment is for 5 million, 10 million, 100 million dollars, you've got no protection whatsoever. The other pushback I sometimes get is that, hey Mauricio, I don't really own anything. I just started, I'm a kid or I just don't have any assets to protect, why bother? The number one asset you have in that case is your, your W-2 job. And these judgments, once they come against you, are good for 10 years and can be renewed. So we're talking about your current streams of income, whatever your job is, but also the streams of income in the future. So if there's a $10 million judgment against you out there or a million dollar judgment against, against you out there, they can attach your wages today, tomorrow, 10 years from now. So it's critical absolutely critical to make sure that once you close on your property, if you haven't already closed in an LLC or some other similar entity, you wanna make sure you transfer that title to the property from your personal name over to an LLC, a limited liability company, so now that the LLC is legally responsible for any liabilities. The second mistake I see is even when people set up LLCs, they don't separate the assets from the liabilities. All LLCs are not created equal, right? So some LLCs are designed to hold your valuable assets like your real estate or your precious metals or your cash or any other investments. And then there are other LLCs that are designed to be your operating companies, like you're running a business or maybe you're the manager. You wanna make sure you always separate the asset from the liability within your LLC structure. So for example, if you're in the real estate world, you wanna have one LLC that actually holds the property and it does nothing else. It literally just sits there holding title to the property. And then you want to have a separate entity that actually runs the day-to-day -day business. For syndicators, we call that a management company and a property month company. But even if you're just investing in single family homes or duplexes, you want to have a management company that doesn't own anything, simply manages the property and collects some fees. But in the event that something were to happen, the management company should get sued because that's the company that's doing all the work, but that the asset is safely tucked away in a separate LLC. So make sure your assets and liabilities are separated within your LLC structure. Mistake number three is not thinking about privacy. Back in the day, I actually used to work for a, a plaintiff's attorney that used to go after people for car accidents, sort of the ambulance chaser, right? And the number one thing a plaintiff's lawyer is gonna do before he even takes on a case is they're gonna do an asset search because most plaintiff lawyers, they get paid on contingency, meaning they don't get paid unless their clients recover. And usually it's about a third. So if they recover, you know, $100,000 of damages, they're gonna get paid $33,000 as the legal fees. But if they recover zero, then they're gonna get paid. So the plaintiff's lawyer is gonna make sure that if they win in a lawsuit, they wanna make sure that there's assets behind there that they can collect. Everybody forgets that it's a two-step process. Step number one is to, is to win the lawsuit and actually get a judgment against somebody. And step number two is to actually collect on that judgment. So privacy really helps to sort of prevent, either prevent a lawsuit from, from happening in the, in the first place because plaintiff's lawyers don't want to go after somebody. I mean, just think about it. If a plaintiff lawyer spends the next three years of their life going after uh, a defendant and it's a, it's a slam dunk case and it's easy to get, but at the end of those three years, they can't collect any money, they're not going to want to do it. And there are very, very few plaintiff's attorneys that will do this on an hourly basis. So having your assets sort of tucked away so that when that plaintiff's lawyer actually does an asset search, they can't find most of your assets. Yes, you wanna keep a bank account with a little bit of money so they can find the bank account. Uh, yes, maybe they see your personal residence, although that's gonna be, you know, we're gonna strip away some of that equity. You wanna appear that you don't have that much money so that they end up settling for whatever insurance limits you have, or maybe they don't even take the case at all, because again, they don't wanna spend the time going through uh, all of that work and not knowing that they can collect. So privacy is super important. We're not relying on privacy. You should always be able to go in front of a judge and show them your asset protection structure and LLCs. None of this is a nefarious or anything like that, but you want to have the privacy so they can't even find stuff on the front end and it sort of deters people from even filing a lawsuit or encourages them to settle once a lawsuit has been filed. Mistake number four is relying on living trusts. A lot of people I talk to say, Mauricio, I've already got a living trust, I'm protected. And that's probably one of the biggest misnomers out there. A living trust has absolutely zero asset protection value. 
A living trust's sole purpose is to avoid probate, meaning if you pass away, you don't want to go through the probate process. It's expensive. It's public. You're going to be paying an attorney that you don't even know. Your estate's going to be paying an attorney. And it's, it takes six, nine, sometimes more than a year to process. So you want to avoid probate. So every single person should have a living trust. But because the living trust is revocable, meaning it can be changed and you're the trustees and you're basically managing the trust, it doesn't provide you with any asset protection value whatsoever. So don't rely on a living trust. Make sure you have LLC structures in place or asset protection trusts, which are irrevocable, but don't rely on a, a living trust. Mistake number five is relying on insurance. Now, this is probably my biggest pet peeve. Now, to be clear, every single person should have insurance. Insurance should be your first line of defense. If a lawsuit happens, you should have an insurance company that's out there that you're going to submit your claim to. But the problem with insurance is really threefold. Number one is that many times your particular issue is excluded from the policy, meaning you're thinking you're making that you're making your premium payments, thinking you're covered for a specific loss. But then when the actual loss happens, it turns out you're not covered because of all these, these exclusions. And if you've ever tried to actually read an insurance policy, it's a nightmare, right? Because, you know, in, in some paragraph, they exclude a particular loss. In another paragraph, they take they put it back in and then they, they, they take it away. I mean, it, it's super complicated. So I typically recommend having an insurance attorney actually reviewing your policy so you understand what's covered. But it's not uncommon for you to be paying your premiums and then having the claim being denied, which is why you want to have your entity structures behind that. So it is your first line of defense, but you don't want to rely on that completely. Number two is that a lot of times you don't have enough insurance or you're underinsured, right? You have a million dollars of insurance in there. Great. But there's a catastrophic loss and you're getting sued for five million. Well, what happens now? Your, your insurance covers a million. You, you're now on the hook for another two, three, four, five. You want to have the backstop of the entity stuff. And the third one, of course, is there are a lot of companies that end up going bankrupt, especially if there's a, a major a major event. So you're not always assured, depending on the insurance company, that when you're it's time to actually uh, claim your insurance, that they're even going to be there. So again, insurance is important. Everyone should have that as their first, first line of defense. But make sure you have the backstop of some sort of entity uh, asset protection structure, whether it's purely entities or some asset protection trusts.